marriage brings unprecedented favor. There are dimensions of favor that will rest on a man's life and on a family if marriage is done under the government and the ordinance of both of you. And I know there's a measure of favor on your life, but there is a unique favor that rests upon a man's life when he gets married. And let me show you why favor is important. There are three things that favor does, and only favor can do it with much ease. Other things can do it. The anointing can do it. Prayer can do it. But when favor does it, it happens with so much ease. We appreciate you seeing this channel. Please remember to leave a comment, share, and subscribe. I want to share with us very briefly on what I've titled The Extraordinary Benefits of Marriage. And I know that um, you are a pastor. You must have done some study on the subject. And of course, there are many things we teach before marriage that is part of the counseling session. We won't go over all of that here. For example, when you are teaching marriage, you teach on the necessity of communication. You teach on the necessity of respect, mutual respect. You teach on matters of parenting. You teach on matters of intimacy. You teach on matters of conflict resolution. And so many other subjects that we deal with in marriage. You teach on matters of respective careers and how to harmonize vision. All of these are syllables that are dealt with in counseling sessions. So we won't go into all of that. This morning, I just want to share briefly with you, just to let you know that marriage is beautiful, and if prosecuted correctly, can translate to a very mighty blessing in your life. My life personally shifted after I got married. So I know by experience that marriage is a huge blessing. I've been married for... A very long time. I'm, I'm now three years in marriage. Uh, you know, in marriage, one year can be ten years. Those who are married, they understand. When you get married, you discover that one year can be ten years. Things that will be revealed to you in one year, you won't know it about yourself in 20 or 30 years of existence. That's when you will know you have pride. Suddenly, you want to show your wife that you are the man. Meanwhile, you would not have known that before, but marriage will reveal you better. It will show you a lot of things. You will know that patience is a virtue. That's when you will discover that you thought you had patience. So one year in marriage is more than 10 years. It's a huge experience. So I've been married for three long years. <laughs> Celebrate our fathers and mothers here who have been married for more than two decades. It takes a lot of grace to be married. But you see, one of the things that keeps you in marriage is when you understand the blessedness of marriage. And I just want to point out four of them quickly because of our time this morning. So you will do everything possible to make your marriage work. Listen, the devil will come against your home. There are two institutions that the devil fights with his best asanas. The first is the church. Jesus said, upon this revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If it says the gates of hell will not prevail... It means the gate of hell will attack it. The only assurance is that the gate of hell will not prevail. The second institution the devil attacks is the marriage institution. Adam was still in the garden of Eden. He had not even given birth to a child. The devil came. He's mindful and aggressive about the marriage institution. His goal is to destroy the church and to destroy the marriage. This is why it takes a lot of maturity, spiritual maturity, emotional maturity, financial maturity to be able to prosecute marriage and this morning i want to show you one of the reasons why you will make the sacrifice to remain married that is the benefits that marriage produces praise god and at least four of them for you very quickly number one marriage brings unprecedented favor there are dimensions of favor that will rest on a man's life and on a family if marriage is done under the government and the ordinance of both of you, and I know there's a measure of favor on your life, but there is a unique favor that rests upon a man's life when he gets married. And let me show you why favor is important. There are three things that favor does, and only favor can do it with much ease. Other things can do it. The anointing can do it. Prayer can do it. But when favor does it, it happens with so much ease. Number one is wealth transfer. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, the Bible said, God gave favor to the Israelites and they spoiled the Egyptians. Imagine that people were in bondage 
for more than 400 years and all of a sudden favor comes upon their lives and their tax masters decided to give them their riches their jewelries their gold what happened how can a slave suddenly become so relevant that a tax master will go to his home pack all his resources and give to him it's called the power of favor when favor comes upon your life you will discover that you will have things that you don't labor for this is why you have to fight for your marriage to work so that your life does not end with labor that does not produce result you will work hard as a man but if favor is not added to your life, you'll be shocked that life itself will become a body. And one of the things that God makes available to enhance favor in your life is the institution called marriage. And so you'll discover that resources begins to flow through your hand that you don't merit on account of labor and hard work. Number two thing that favor does is that favor breaks protocols. In Esther chapter 5 from verse 1 to 2, the Bible told us about Esther that she went to see the king at a time that was unlawful. Ideally, she should have been killed for breaking royal protocols. But the Bible said when the king looked at her, he found favor in her. And instead of dealing with her for violating protocols, what happened was that the king told her to come. And when she showed up, the king said, what do you want? I will give it to you. And the king didn't stop there. It would have been wise for the king to hear her at least, just in case she says something that he can't give. Because in the ancient times, the authority and the dignity of a king, the regard a king has, is the value that his words command. That's why kings don't speak carelessly. Remember, when John the Baptist was killed, the Bible said the daughter of Herodias danced before the king and the king was excited and said, whatever you ask, I will give you. And the young lady asked for the head of John. Scriptures revealed that the king was pained, but he has already spoken. So even though he didn't like it, he couldn't reverse it because his word is his bond. That's how kings operate in ancient kingdom. If a king speaks, he will not change his mind. So for that king to make that kind of statement, it means there was a power that came upon him that was almost like a spare. And I can tell you today that that power is favor. And the king told her, whatever you want, I will give you. Even without asking, the king went further to say, even if it is half of my kingdom. Who talks like that? Only a man who is under a spare can talk like that. And that's the power that favor brings upon the life of a man. And Jesus taught, taught us in scriptures by the Holy Spirit that when a man gets married, favor comes upon his life. That means from today, you will start breaking protocols if you understand the blessedness of marriage. That means from today, you will start having resources that you didn't necessarily work for. I'm saying this thing so that you build a consciousness. As a spiritual man, you will fast. You will give. You will pray. You will serve the Lord. But you need to understand that marriage is a unique benefit that God has added to you. So favor provokes breaking of protocols. Favor provokes transfer of wealth unmerited. And finally, favor also attracts the allegiance of men. The Bible said daily, men joined themselves to David until his host became like the host of God. There are many men that on a normal day would not want to have any business with you. But you'll be shocked that now that you are married, something will gravitate them in your direction. I'm telling you, if you build this consciousness, you'll be shocked. I will never have need for men in my life. I will never have need to beg for men in my life because there is a system I am working in that attracts the submission and the allegiance of men. Not because I'm the best of leaders, but it's a system in the spirit. I will never beg for money in my life because in addition to covenant practice, in addition to diligent lifestyle, there is a system of favor around my life that causes money that I don't work for to come to me. And I will never be stranded before any protocol in my life. Because I have something working in me that breaks protocols. Sustain this mentality. See, the reason we, we, we do all we can by the grace of God to cause our marriage to work is because we have this understanding. I'm telling you, men are frustrated in life who has no business to be frustrated. And most times the reason is because there are unresolved disputes in the family. Most times because there are crises in the family that is not resolved. If you understand this, if anything attacks your home, you will attack that thing. Because you know it's attacking your destiny. And trust me, sir, as a man of God, you need a lot of favor. And that's why the Bible gives us the advantage of entering into the marriage institution. He who finds a wife finds a good thing 
and obtains favor from the Lord. The second blessing of marriage is exponential power. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 30. The Bible made a statement. It said, if one chases a thousand and two chases, a, chases ten thousand, is it not because God has given, given their enemies to their hands? You know what that means? It doesn't just suggest that the propensity of two people bonded together supersedes that of one by exponential ten. It suggests that when a man gets married, God weakens his enemies for him to subdue. So there is nothing that can successfully stand against you if you remain accurate in your union. It says if one chases a thousand, it says two definitely will put ten thousand to flight because God will put them in their hands. So there is a dimension of authority and power you will begin to walk in today because you are married. And you know that marriage is the smallest nucleus of the organizational church. Every Christian is a church because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But when it has to do with organizational church, the Bible says wherever two or three are gathered. So you don't need to come to service to have a church anymore. In your bedroom, there can be a church there. In your parlor, there can be a church there. Because now, in perpetuity, both of you will work together for a lifetime. And that is why you will command authority that is superior to the authority that you were wielding as an individual. So it's a blessing that marriage brings. Because marriage gives two of you the opportunity to work together in companionship for the rest of your life. Number three, what's the blessedness of marriage? Ecclesiastics chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. There are rewards that God gives to people who are married. You know, we understand as Christians that our reward is in heaven. But I want to tell you that it's not all rewards that are in heaven. There are eternal rewards and there are earthly rewards. Are you following this? You know, the Bible says, He that prayeth in secret, He said, The Father seeth him and will reward him openly. So, reward is not only in eternity. There are many men who are enjoying reward on earth today. And in that scripture, the Bible showed us two dimensions of reward. Or three. Number one, it says one can be subdued. It says, But two cannot be subdued. If one falls, the other will lift him up. So, the first reward is strength. That means from today, nothing can break you anymore. Whether it is spiritual, emotional, or bodily. Because now you have another position source where you draw strength from. Are you following this? This is why marriage is a blessing. And this is why you cannot allow the devil bring anything in, in between the two of you. Because largely, you will draw strength from this woman. And largely, she will draw strength from you. Because the first reward that you will receive as a married man is that you become unbroken. Nothing can break you anymore. You become like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. Number two reward, the Bible said, when two lie together, they produce something. Not just heat. Even offsprings are a reward. That's why I say children is the heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. No matter how strong you are, you can't give birth as an individual. You are not an amoeba. So every time you lie together, life is produced. And if you understand this, you will know that it's not just children that are produced. It means your intimacy has the power to generate life. It also means, therefore, that every time you and your wife are in agreement, you can change anything. Because you produce life. So if there is any oppression of death around you, go home and hold your wife. That intimacy has the power to produce life. Every time you are intimate with your wife, prophesy, you will be shocked what will happen. Because when you lie together, the Bible said you produce offsprings. You produce heat. So your marriage has become a factory for producing good things. And if you know it, you can channel it to spiritual things. You can channel it to psychological things. And you can channel it to natural things. These are secrets encoded in this union. This is why Paul calls it a mystery. He said it's like the union between Christ and the church. That's the same union that exists between husband and wife. It's a mystery. You can change your world. If you understand how marriage works, there is life produced. There is energy produced. Resources can be produced. And it's one of the blessedness of marriage. So blessed, blessings of marriage, number one, is favor. Number two, is exponential power and authority. Number three, is reward. And number four, is that your home becomes an embassy of blessings. In Psalm 133, verse 1 to 3, it says, Behold, 
how beautiful, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in harmony. It's like the oil flowing from the head of Aaron through his beard down to his skirt. It's like the dew upon Mount Zion. He said, there the Lord commands his blessing. Four things happens when brethren are together in harmony. Number one, he said they become good. And that good is talking about it's not just character oriented type of good. It's a good that when people see you, they'll be fulfilled. They'll be satisfied. It's the same kind of good that the Bible recorded in Genesis 1. That when God created the light, he saw it and it was good. So suddenly, an aroma comes out of your life that make people become pleasant and favorably disposed towards you. They won't even know why. Anytime you come out, you suddenly begin to look better. You know, so earlier, I used to think it's because when you are married, you feed well and you become a bit chubby. Because some of us, before we married, we were like this. We, so you think it's, it's a good about suit. It's not a, a suit type of good. Though. It's a good, it's, a, it's an aroma, a spiritual aroma type of good. Suddenly you come out, you look more mature. You look more gathered. You look more organized. And people begin to look at you in a different way. They honor, they even accord you becomes different. Because how good and pleasant it is for brethren. So even people who were reproachful towards you for no just cause, you will discover that they will suddenly become favorably disposed towards you. That's what marriage does. And it doesn't stop there. It said there's an anointing that also flows. When people dwell together in harmony, the oil from the head of Aaron to his beard down to his skirt. And it's not just an anointing that flows carelessly. It's an anointing that brings equilibration. So what happens at the head happens at the skirt. So you now discover that you will become sufficient in the measures of the anointing. Nothing lacking, nothing broken, nothing stolen. Because that harmony has a lot of power. And it doesn't stop there. It said your home become like Mount Zion. The dew upon Mount Zion. That's the glory of God. That dew speaks of the glory. And you know what the glory of God does? It's a defense. When Moses left Egypt, he didn't have a trained army. He didn't have economic resources. He didn't have structures to manage the crisis of the wilderness. He didn't have weapons and an army to tackle his enemy. The glory was enough. When that glory walked with them, no nation could conquer them. When that glory walked with them, everything they required was provided for them. They no longer knew a wilderness. Manna came in the wilderness. They found water from the rock in the wilderness. Everything they required was provided and that was not enough none was feeble among their tribe even sickness was swallowed up and that was not all even their clothes the bible said grew with them and their sandals did not grow weary so there is a level of extraordinary sufficiency that the glory brings for you see you will never lack water you will never lack money you will never beg for bread because something will be working in your life if only you sustain the harmony of marriage. See, people don't know why the devil attacks marriage. The devil knows these things. He's a prince in Zion before he fell. He's an angelic functionary. So he can peep into the secrets of God. God created man in his own image. That's already more than enough weapon. As if that is not enough. God is still adding buffers to, to give the man blessings beyond the mind. That's why the devil will attack every home not to walk. You see people quarreling over toothpaste. Why did you press it from under? Why did you press it from middle? You think it's about toothpaste? You see somebody comes home, he's just angry because they didn't cook the food he want. Okay, you are not a lion. Your goal in life is not to eat. So you need to know that what is going on there is deeper than what you are seeing. If you now understand the blessedness of marriage, you will know why. So you become good and pleasant. The anointing begins to flow without measure. And then you become like the similitude of the glory of God. Lacking nothing whatsoever. And then finally, he said, there the Lord commands the blessing. That means if people are looking for blessing, it's in your home. And you need to know what blessing is to appreciate it. The word blessing means empowered to prosper. That means whatever you lay your hands to do, we walk. Even if it was failing before you came, it will start working. That's the blessing of Psalm 1 verse 1 to 3. He said, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor standeth in the way of, of, of sinners, nor is seated in the seat of the scornful. He said his delight is on the law of the Lord. And on this law doth he meditate day and night. He is like the tree planted by the rivers of living waters. He produces his fruit in his season. He said whatsoever he doeth, whatsoever, not some things, whatsoever he doeth, he said he shall prosper. And that is the same blessing that God transferred into marriage. There, the Lord commands his blessing. Anything you touch will work if you will keep the harmony of the home. And so the marriage institution is a blessed institution. But you will now understand that there is a condition. The condition is what? There must be harmony in the home. And so whatever you can do to keep harmony in the home, that becomes the key to your invincibility. And many don't know this. That becomes the key for animating the blessings of marriage. That becomes the key of releasing the potentials of marriage to keep the harmony of the home. And Paul the Apostle graciously gave us a formula. Can we have Ephesians 5, 22 to 27? Every time I teach on marriage, I teach this. Because this is where the devil is attacking. And this is what the people of the world don't want to hear. Ephesians 5. Can we project scriptures? Okay, the early day today is for design. <laughs> you know, Pastor Kings loves uh, excellence. So they have converted uh, the LED to part of design. He gave two, one instruction each to wives and husbands as the key, the secret of harmony. And many don't know this. Harmony is not difficult if you will keep the code and the ordinances of scripture. It began with the wife. Every time we teach, we begin with wife because that's how the scripture put it. We are not the one that wrote it. Because when you are preaching this and you start talking and you start with wife, they will say, why are they always hammering on women? We are not hammering, we are following Bible. If you go to relationship seminar in, or in Harvard, they may teach some principles that they know, but we are talking Bible. And this is what Paul said. He said, for wives, oh, let me use a KJV it's so that I don't open too many things. He said, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. So, that's why when, before I joined you, I had you reaffirm your faith. That means you are Christians and you are under the Lord. So you understand what it means to submit yourself unto the Lord. He said the way you submit yourself unto the Lord is a submit yourself to your husband. He didn't say women submit to men as unto the Lord. He said wives. So if you have chosen to be a wife, then you must understand that your code is submission. I've taught before. I said women have four stages of development. There's a stage where they are girls. Their strength is their body. And that's why the moment they start reaching 12, 13, they live in front of the mirror. Even their footsteps change. They start walking, they call, guy, guy literally. They now mature. Their strength becomes their mind. And every lady must have a sound mind. It's only an insecure man that is afraid for a woman to have a sound mind. If you are a man and you love a woman genuinely, you want her to have a sound mind. And that's why every father trains the daughter. So, if you love a woman genuinely, she must develop her mind and you must allow her use it. She's not daft. She's not a clown. And God help you that she does because the personality of your wife will impart on your children more than yours. What she tells, she, they, they literally learn from her far more than they learn from you. That's why even the first language they speak is called mother tongue, not father tongue. So, if your wife is daft here, yeah, your children will be daft. There's no room for insecurity. And they have a part to play in society. But you see, when you become a wife, it's a, your code is submission. And that's why you don't marry to become a wife. You are a wife to be found. It's a he who finds a wife. So it's not marriage that made you a wife. It's maturity that made you a wife. So you mature to a place where you submit to God's ordinance. And then you become a mother, of course, which is sacrifice. The strength of every mother is sacrifice. Glory to God. So he said, wives, submit yourself to your husband. So if you are a wife, you must make up your mind. Don't let the, the corruption coming from the West educate you. 
That's why their marriages don't work. In case you go and watch a documentary online from America, from Europe, seven out of every ten marriages, they break. So if they are mentoring you, know that your own is about to break. We are Christians and we operate by Bible standard, biblical standard. Submit yourself to your husband. And in case you don't know how, he said, as unto the Lord. In case you don't know how, he went further. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let a wife be subject to her husband. So he gave you a clear picture of how to do it. And you see, there are four levels of submission that every wife must submit or learn to undergo. Number one is submission of identity. That's why from today, your surname we have to change. I'm telling you, and there is so much corruption in the West today. Today, women don't change their surnames. That's why before we did this thing we did here this morning, your father had to hand you over to the church and the church handed you over to your husband. So if you are a wife, you must learn to submit your identity. I know there are unique cases where through mutual agreement, a wife may be allowed to keep her surname as well. These things happen. For example, there are places where certain men don't have any male children and a generation is about to be wiped up. So out of honor, you can be asked to just keep your son. All of those things happen. I'm not against if there is a mutual agreement. But you need to understand that you have to submit your identity. You will henceforth find your identity in him. And that's how heaven recognizes it. That's why I say a woman cannot prophesy with her head uncovered. That means that woman must always stay under government. The husband must be her identity. He wasn't talking about this head. Because in the, pre in the previous verses, he called the man the head of the wife. So if you are studying in context, it's talking about the man. So the woman must come under the covering of the husband so that the husband will have honor as she submits to him. So you submit identity. Number two, you submit resources. And I tell you why you submit resources. Only a harlot gives her body to collect money. Because a harlot values money more than her body. If you have submitted your body, then there's nothing you can keep anymore. Otherwise, that thing is more important than your body. And I also understand that in, there are contexts where a husband lacks proper financial management. Where through mutual agreement, the wife has to keep the resources of the home for the benefit of that government. I also know that there are contexts where a husband can be riotous and the wife may have to keep her resources because it is most reasonable and other authorities like the church can give that level of clearance. But at the foundational level, you must understand that everything you have, you now share with your husband. And when you share these things, women say, no, no, ah, men, men, that's why we warn you. Don't marry somebody that you love because you saw the size of his chest. Marry somebody that you trust. Because it's foolishness to want to commit your life to somebody and then you are saying, ha, me, I'm careful. If you, are, if you are afraid, why did you enter the marriage? Is that not risk that is unreasonable? If you don't trust a man enough to submit to that man, what are you doing with him in the altar? What are you doing with him on the altar? You must learn to trust before you submit your feelings because there are requirements in this institution. Number three, you submit your authority. That means you come under his authority. He becomes your head. So everything you want to do today, he has to give permission for you to do it. That's how God designed it. You can no longer wake up and say, I want to go to Dubai. I feel like going on holiday. You can no longer wake up and say, I want to do this. I want to. It's no longer in your syllabus. From today is may I. That's marriage. And thank God, what I'm sharing here is not in Oxford. <laughs> I'm sharing it in church. If I go out for marriage seminar, I will talk about friendship. <laughs> but when I'm in church, I will talk Bible. Praise God. Are you following this? And then finally, you submit your body. Because that's the highest thing you have. You submit your body. Mutually. You submit your body. Your body is no longer your own. 
your body belongs to your husband as much as it belongs to you. You have to submit your body to your husband. These are four levels of submission and this is the code for harmony in marriage. You must have heard it in many places that all men desire is respect and honor. It's God that designed it that way because God already gave a commandment that women should submit. That's why he designed it that way. Then you think God was harsh with women. You now come to the men. And God now went further and gave men even a more superior standard. He said in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So the love that God told men to give their wives is not feeling. It's absolute sacrifice and sacrifice unto death. So a man who does not love a woman enough to die for her has no right to call himself a husband. So it's actually a balanced equation. This is why a woman who submits to a husband, who is a husband indeed, is not taking a risk. Because at the end of the day, everything that man has, he will relinquish it back to the woman. Submit yourself to your husband. When God wanted to create the wife, he killed the man. He put a deep sleep on the man to remove his rib. So the way you husband a wife is by dying. If you are not ready to submit unto death, you can never pass the test of a husband. And the Bible said, if you don't deal with her like this, it says, even your prayers will be hindered. First Peter 3, verse 6 and 7. So you will discover that in her own case, if she fails, God says, teacher, in your own case, when you fail, God will cut his relationship with you. So the penalty God gives to you is more because it looks like you are the head. So you exercise more authority. That's why God is more stringent with you. And I'm telling you, the reason many men are frustrated today is because they are not husbands. They have not matured. The same way a wife matures through four stages, a husband also matures. You must mature from the level of a boy, where your, your, all your value is your strength. It's only a boy that shows muscles. Everything is about fight and muscle. When you mature from a boy, you become a young man. A young man has a higher level of maturity. A young man takes responsibility. What can I do to improve humanity? What can I do to improve society? What can I do to improve the life of others? That's what makes you a husband. And then when you, that's what makes you a young man. Then when you grow from a young man, you become a husband. And the job of a husband is to love, is to care, is to sacrifice. But unfortunately, many married men are still boys. That's why the moment the woman talks, they slap, they punch the person. Because all their glory is their muscle. They have not mature to young men who take responsibility. See, if there is problem in your house, it's your responsibility to settle it. I grew into this thing, even myself after getting married. I quarreled with my wife. I was there doing ego and pride. My wife had to come to me to apologize before the Holy Ghost told me you are kana and you are not mature. Because if your wife is the one that has the maturity to approach you to solve the problem, then you are a boy. When there is a problem in the house, as a man who has grown from a boy to a young man, when the tempo comes down, you call your wife and sit down. This is what I meant. This is how it should have been done. I'm sorry if my approach was wrong, but I believe this is how you should have done it. That way she will learn, she will also grow. Because your duty, the Bible said, is to wash her by washing with water by the word of God. So the same way Christ is purifying the church, he expects you to purify your husband and your wife. And the way you purify your wife is not by slapping her. It's by teaching her the word of God. The word is remata. So you speak the living word inspired by the Holy Ghost to improve her. But it will take a lot of maturity to do it. And then as a husband, you love her. You care for her. You are responsible towards her. And you make it a lifestyle to sacrifice for her happiness. If you have not come to that level, you are not qualified to be a husband. And as I round up, there are four levels of love that a husband shows to a wife. The same way a wife has four levels of submission, there are four levels of love. The first level of love is filio. Three of them are in the Bible, and I don't have time to go into scriptures now. Filio is friendship. I teach all the time, and I tell you, husband and wife are not friends. A husband is the Lord over the wife. However, it's the responsibility of the man to build friendship in the relationship. So you are the one through maturity and wisdom to make your wife become happy and 
graciously submitted in love and willingly, not by compulsion. If you have to force your wife to submit to you, it means you are not operating like Christ. I tell people most of the time, no woman on earth will have a problem submitting to Jesus. So if men are like Christ, the issue and the argument of submission will not exist. The reason women struggle to submit to men is because the men getting married are not like Christ. And so the women too refuse to be like the church. So you must take the responsibility first to be like Christ. And the way you show that love is by building friendship. Making her become confident in you. So that her work with you will grow from emotion into understanding and into trust. She will not just... See, this emotion you are feeling now, after two months, you'll be shocked. You will now discover that understanding is superior to emotion. And then there is a level you will get to. You will not even understand yourself. You will now discover that trust is superior to understanding. So you have to carry her from emotion through understanding to trust. And that's the code of friendship. So that she will trust you more than she trusts her female friends. Most women confide in their female friends much more than they confide in their husbands. So you must make her your friend. It is part of your responsibility as Lord. Do you know why people have problem with this idea of lordship? Because the lordship men have shown over the years is the lordship of the first Adam, not the lordship of the last Adam. There are two Adams. The first Adam was corrupt by the serpent. So his lordship is manipulation and tyranny. But the last Adam, that is the portrait of marriage, is Christ. His lordship is sacrifice. His lordship is selflessness. His lordship is love. And if you have that nature of the last Adam, your wife will not be afraid to submit to you. And the way you demonstrate it is by friendship. Make her your friend. If you need to buy her gifts, if you need to take her out for a retreat, if you need to take her out on holiday, if you need to apologize when there is challenge, if you need to support her to cook and wash plate, do it. Oh God, this is not the Doma. This is church. <laughs> Before you come and say, where, where we come from? Men don't wash plates. Which men? What have they achieved? <laughs> men, men, uh, wait, wait, wait. How, how can I go to the kitchen? I'm a man. I'm a man. You are a man. <laughs> You'll see a woman pregnant, six months. She's still cooking and washing plates. I'm a man sitting in the parlor. And you think she will ever be your friend? There are times when she wants to go to the kitchen. You say, no, my dear, rest. Rest, rest. Go and cook and bring. If you don't know how to cook, go to the kitchen, lock the door, call somebody. Order for food. When they bring it, put it in the plate and bring it. <laughs> it doesn't matter who cooked it. At the end of the day, you have shown love. <laughs> you know how it works? When she eats it, she will say, no. You can't cook like this. You say, relax. I've learned a lot of things. <laughs> you didn't say I've learned how to cook. I've learned what? A lot of things. Even if she discover you bought it. See, women are lovely people. She will be so happy that you took the pain and the sacrifice to do all of this to make her happy. That is somebody who has cooked for you for, for a whole year. You do it once. She will be so grateful that you took the pain to do this for her. You will see that the atmosphere of love will break in your house. All the tension is not necessary. It will affect your inspiration. So the time that you should be hearing the voice of God, you are trying to show you a man. And before you know, five years has passed. You have not made progress. Build friendship. Number two level of love is called iros. It's romantic attraction. Listen. Let your wife be attracted to you and be attracted to your wife. It is outside marriage that romance is forbidden. In marriage, it's a legal requirement. In fact, it's a responsibility. So it's not that I'm not feeling like, no, there's nothing like I'm not feeling like. It's a responsibility. It will be wrong for your wife to be romantically starved. It means you are an irresponsible man. So create atmospheres that releases affection. And by all means, let your wife be happy and always attracted towards you. Oga, okay, sometimes cut your hair, dress well. Appear like the prince that you are. It's important. <laughs> My God. 
Show care, extraordinary care. There are times when me and my wife want to go somewhere. After she is close to entering the car, I will run and open the door. She will look at me and say, politician. <laughs> but she will smile the evening. She will smile the evening. Create those atmospheres. Very important. Third level of love is called toge. That's companionship. See, one of the things the devil uses against women is loneliness. Because they were created to be help meet. So naturally, a woman wants to stay around someone that gives her assurance. That's what her father did until she's getting married now. Her father is there and she's sure that any day, any time she has an issue, she doesn't need to call. Her father will always be there. She needs to have that assurance of companionship. And not just now that you are married, even in old age, that you will not leave her for any woman, for any reason, that you stay with her because you love it and you want to. It's a level of love that you demonstrate. Listen, your wife should not be insecure around you. Deliberately want to talk to her. Deliberately find out what she's doing. Deliberately help her with the things she's doing, even if they seem to be the responsibility of the wife. Show her companionship. Sometimes go to the market with her. Sometimes go to the kitchen, stay there while she's cooking. Just show her that you are there. Sometimes take her to the saloon, wait, let her make her hair. You'll be shocked the way her money will be built in your home. See, men make their lives difficult by unnecessary sophistication. You don't have to be sophisticated with your wife. After all, she knows all your weaknesses. Companionship is a love responsibility. And finally, it's agape. Agape is sacrifice. At all points, if you have to inconvenience yourself for her to be happy, do it with joy. That's why you called her. Do you know why you are called, you are called the husband? You are a gardener. Your job is to take care of the garden so that at all times he models his greatest potential. But if you are a selfish man, you can never do that. And I can assure you, many men are so selfish and self-centered. That's why their wives hide their money from them. The moment you hear that she has anything, you will walk and come back and say, there's this thing I wanted to do. When, but when there's money, we'll do it. She will say, yes, when there's money, we will do it. You will come back after two hours and say, did you say you have something somewhere that time? Can I borrow? She will trust, try you the first time, try you the second time. The third time, if you want to borrow, she will say, I don't have money. Thing. Because she has seen that you are selfish and self-centered. And all these things you want to do is always about yourself. There are men who will collect all their wife's money. They won't buy one gift for them. They only think about themselves. Because ideally, their idea of love is them. So the reason they are even marrying a woman is because they are sexually attracted to her. It's for self-aggrandizement. They never think about the person. They only gather people around them to use. Your wife can be one of such people. You must show sacrifice. Listen, always go out of your way to make her happy. And many times, do things because of her, not you. That's how Christ loved the church. He said he loved the church and gave himself. So the first thing you give to your wife is yourself before your money. Before any other thing you give yourself. Let her know that she has you. Not because she manipulated you, but because you surrendered yourself as a token of love. That is more important to her than the ring. Because if she can't have you, she will throw that ring in the gutter. Are you following this? If you do this, you will enjoy the blessedness of marriage. It's my prayer that the Lord will not only preserve your home, but the Lord will use your home as an institution for affecting a generation. It's my prayer that all of the blessings that comes with marriage, from favor to exponential authority and invincibility, and all of the blessings, the oppression of the anointing, the glory of God, let all find expression in your marriage. And because your marriage will be accurate, may it become the inspiration for many other marriages. I pray for you today that God will cause you not to miss it. 
and every attack of the devil on your home is destroyed and it will not stand. So let it be written. So let it be established in Jesus' precious name.